and welcome back to another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand a month. Now, this next guest takes us on a wild ride from building race cars in university to working in the Arctic to raising funds for a startup and going on a wild adventure ever since. Now, I wish I could sum up the resilience of Mike Bukage, but you'll have to hear it from him. So let's give him a chance to introduce himself. My name is Michael Bukage, founder of Iceberg Cyber. This is a second time in a startup company. First startup was called FiboSync. Before that, I was messing around with uh, grad school. I actually worked in the Arctic doing water quantity assessments. We can talk about that a little bit. Uh, trained as a mechanical engineer at UFT, Toronto boy, Maple Leafs fan with the Tavares jersey in the background. Signed. Signed Tavares jersey. Signed in person Tavares jersey when he had his homecoming party. Six years ago when he signed his captain. Yeah. In in university, I actually built race cars for five years. So totally different life than what I'm doing now in cybersecurity. Mm. That That is sort of like the fun thing of what I've been doing. It's almost like a cat. I've lived several different lives. Lived and went to school in the Arctic. Built race cars before that environmental engineer, software developer, cybersecurity specialist now. Now, does that Arctic experience have anything related to the name Iceberg? Totally. Okay. Yeah, totally. The whole iceberg theme is to promote the Canadian, Canadiana, Arctic, Northern, Northern experience. Okay. Plus it's got a ton of good visuals with like the stuff that you see above the surface, stuff you don't see below mm. the surface, mm. tip of the iceberg. Mm. Plus mm. people say iceberg in like every book, every mm. show. So I consider that product placement, free product placement. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's start there. You know, take us back to that chilly iceberg, that, what did you say, the Arctic experience? Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. How did you even end up there? 2014, I was working for, as a mechanical engineer, working for a uh, bike design company, okay. racing bikes. Racing bikes, like... Not motorcycles, like uh, road racing like, bicycles. Like a bicycle. Yeah. Okay. Like we Tour were, de France type of... Exactly. Okay. We had, we had one model in the Tour. We were doing bikes for Diamondback wind tunnel design. It was fun. That was a different life. That was right after graduation. That's crazy. And this was right after you were doing the race car stuff. That's right. Honestly, let's go back even before okay, the Arctic then. Again. Because, yeah, dude. Because like, what do you mean you're, you're making race cars? So 2007, I went to the University of Toronto. The first day of Frosh Week, I wandered into the race car shop. The Every university, effectively every university in the world, a lot of them in North America have a formula SAE or formula student design wow. team where the students design, build, and race wow. a, an F1 style car. So as a young 17 year old kid, I walked into that shop and I stayed there for five years, almost every day Wow! and every night until they kicked me out because I graduated from school and had to go into the real world. What's the fastest you've ever driven? Not in those cars. Like we, were, <laughs> we were pulling maybe, maybe almost two G's um in any direction mm. you know you know, up so there was uh they were like souped up pumped up go-karts if you okay. can imagine okay Ju built just large enough for a guy like me to drive in because i was one of the drivers okay and that was that was five years of life and experience and adventure okay. doing silly things with my friends learning how to be an engineer okay. traveling to germany and the united states to race well, we're not interviewing you about race cars, so something must have happened. Well, or is this I, a show I, about race cars? No, we can talk about race cars if you want <laughs> at any point. I'm, I'm still yeah. involved. When, okay. After we graduated, some friends and I, we created our own version of the competition. So, because cool. there was no Canadian, uh, that was called, there was no Canadian event. That was called Formula North, again, okay. with the like Northern Canada thing. Okay, okay. So You're cool. I like that. That is, that is one facet of life that I've lived for seven, 16 years now. Cool. I'm waiting to the point where I think next year the students that join the team will have not have been born when I was on the team, like where you had that halfway point. That's cool. Then, uh, then I'll be have fun. But you know, <laughs> like like many things, I did that for five years and mm -hmm. I just got bored with doing it. Wow. And like I I still volunteer and help the kids with their race car, but it doesn't get me going the same way anymore because I lived it like every day, mm -hmm. every night for five years mm -hmm. and wanted something different. Mm. So after I graduated, we were doing the bike stuff. Then for no reason other than to like shake it up, I applied to grad school, went to York University in an environmental engineering program. Okay. 
Why, why, why switch? I was looking for a new challenge. Yeah. I was looking for a new challenge. I needed, I, I wanted something different to do. Okay. And that was cool for a bit. I went on an exchange to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which was fantastic. Wow. University of Alaska Fairbanks has, if, if you want to learn about cold weather engineering, civil mm-hmm. engineering, that's the place to go. Okay. So I, I lived that for for a term. And what is cold weather civil engineering exactly? Dude, I started accounting and now I do media stuff. Nice. Like what is I, what is cold weather civil engineering? What does that mean? Like are well, you building a bridge that could withstand When ice? you want to build a bridge okay. that has to live in like negative 40 Celsius. Call you. That, yeah, you can call me. <laughs> okay. I got the textbook still. I could dust it off and okay. I can tell you how to do it. All right, all right. Um, and that's what, so that's what you were studying? Like how, to, how do we build bridges in minus 1,000 weather? A little bit of that. Okay. Our, my specific area was on predicting when small northern towns would run out of water. Because wow. the, the challenge when you live in a frozen environment like that is that the water freezes mm-hmm. and you can't drink frozen water. You can only drink liquid water. Oh, wow. So we, m- my professor and I, we built this like prediction model so that we could guess when these towns would run out of water, if what they would run thought. out of water. It was like a risk assessment. What a thought. And is this like at what period of the season or are they going to run out the, of water? All of their problems this... are like end of winter. Okay. Because how it is in all these small towns is that they'll have a, a lake that they drink the water out of, okay. just like Lake Ontario, except their lakes are, are much smaller. Mm-hmm. And over the winter time, the lake freezes over and the ice starts growing down into the lake. Okay. And at some point you don't have enough liquid water and yeah. you either have to thaw it, which is super expensive because you got to burn diesel to, to mm-hmm. liquefy mm-hmm. or you got to fly in bottled water in an emergency, wow. which happens far more often than it should. Wow. And so that was sort of the pain that we were trying to solve was wow. give them advance notice so that if five years, if the town was growing well enough and the climate was, was changing, they would say in five years, we're going to have issues with water. So let's start planning now. What a cool problem to explore. You know, yeah. that's really interesting. The uh one of the, one of our previous guests um actually delivers food to the Arctic and uh and solves a lot of food insecurity issues in those spaces. So it's really cool that this is something that you were studying. Because like, dude, we live in a city, right? So these aren't things that we ever think are problems. Mm-hmm. Most of the people don't even ask where does our water come from when they turn the tap. They literally just turn the tap and all of a sudden cold and hot comes up. And it's like, yeah, I could drink this. Cool. Okay. Go back to work. Right. So that's it's really cool that that's a problem that you explored. So what uh, what kind of happened after that? I was at the end of the environmental engineering program at York mm-hmm. and a close friend of mine was also in grad school, electrical engineering. He was studying fiber photonics, which is like a very niche electrical engineering yeah. uh, thing, discipline. And we were both at a point in our lives where we didn't like what we were doing. We were bored with the stuff that we had already been doing. He was one of my race car friends. And uh, we had the crazy bad idea to try and start our own business. Dude, fiber photonics. <laughs> That's right. So fiber photonics is like a really, really niche discipline of yeah. electrical engineering. We're, we're all benefiting from the fiber photonics industry right now. Like the internet in this office is brought by fiber. Oh, so this is so, like fiber internet. This is like fiber okay. internet with a with a special twist on it where we were using very similar technology to how internet is delivered to people's homes now mm-hmm. and modifying it to build temperature and pressure sensors. So it's, it's industrial niche, super techie type stuff. Why would somebody <laughs> want to do that though? Like why is that? Like, Why would that? someone want to tar- start a business or use it? Well, I know why people would want to start a business, but like I don't think I would ever use a fiber thermometer yeah. Right, like, why would I? Why would I use that as a as a regular person? All right, I'm gonna or, put my Fibos hat back on and okay. try and try and pitch you genuinely. All right, let's hear. You know, like it's it's a it's a tainted mind now. Okay. <laughs> so the the pitch was okay. The the technical pitch was with a fiber optic temperature sensor, you can measure very extreme temperatures. Okay. Like we're talking about two thousand Fahrenheit, thousand degrees Celsius. Okay. So a temperature that would melt any metal. Mm-hmm. Any metal thermometer would melt at that temperature, but our fiber optic temperature sensors wouldn't. Okay. Or you could measure temperature in a nuclear environment. We did mm. some um, we did some projects with the Triumph particle accelerator at University of British Columbia. Cool. Or you can measure temperature in a high voltage transformer where wow. there's like risk of spark and electrocution okay. which we did some of that too oh, so there wow. was some like 
you know, we had a good mouse trap. There's some yeah. good mouse trap opportunities there. Mm -hmm. That's why someone may use a fiber optic temperature sensor. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say with a straight face that they should use it because clearly I didn't make that business case when we were in business. Yeah, yeah. And not enough people did use fiber optic sensors as actual products. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I would you buy that now? Like, no. oh, no. And I, <laughs> I would sell it. I have a whole basement full of it still. We have a lot of unused product in the basement. Well, just yeah. in case we we don't decide to open the window today, we could we could figure out how hot you it can is measure the room. temperature in this room. Yeah, with a ton of like super overpriced fiber optic yeah. sensors. Yeah, hey man, at least it won't melt. So that's right, like the iceberg will. The, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you put, <laughs> put that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm guessing this business that you guys did. How did you guys fund this thing? Well, we started like almost every startup does by bootstrapping. Okay. We didn't pay ourselves any money. Yeah. And we went like that for six months or so before we started getting hungry and mm. desperate. Mm. And then we were able to find some government grants and uh, we won a contest, a pitch contest that gave us some, some startup cash. Nice. How much did you guys win in the contest? 30 grand, I think. Okay. So it not, a, not quite it was a It was a yet. TMU pitch competition back in twenty. 16 early 2016 okay okay yeah now in this business was that the first time that you touched 100 grand yeah okay okay yeah, now walk us through kind of like that experience and getting to that point you know because like listen it's sometimes we explore it in a year sometimes we explore it in a month sometimes we explore it in a day i know this business was very different in mm -hmm. nature like you're not selling like thousand dollar things thousand dollar things thousand dollar things sometimes you're raising it sometimes you're winning it in a pitch competition so walk us through the life cycle of what that looked like in mm -hmm. uh in this business because you're winning a pitch competition 30 grand boom you go mm -hmm. for a minute we and... actually did win a ninety thousand dollar check in a pitch competition so what that that type of cash is out there if okay. you want to if you want to go the circuit okay that was that was kind of a cool experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah most of our over our lifespan at fibos yeah our cash either came from selling some product on small scale doing development projects paid development projects for some mm -hmm. um, customers we got a ton of government grants for R and D research. That was sort of like the niche we were in. Yeah. And then, like many startups, we raised equity capital through angel investors. Wow. Which is uh, which is like the main road that people go down. Mm -hmm. If you have a good idea and you're you're a compelling speaker and you got some charisma, you can find partners to back you. We found great supporters to back us. They believed in the vision. We believed in the vision at the time. We didn't know that it wasn't gonna work out. Yeah. We found great par partners to back us. They put in their hard-earned money believing in us, and we put in our hard effort yeah. trying to make it work. <laughs> and we came out with more learning than earning, but that's mm. sometimes how it goes. So walk us through the life cycle of all of it. Like what, what ended up happening with that business? And I would love for you to kind of sum up some of your key lessons, key takeaways. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure you've reflected on it lots. So let's, let's hear it. We survived for six years. Mm -hmm. We shut down the business last year, 2022, moved mm -hmm. all the stuff, liquidated as many pieces of equipment as we could, mm -hmm. sold it off for pieces. That was the unfortunate end to a really fun adventure. Mm. My condolences. Oh, thank you. At the beginning, it was, it was myself and my co-founder. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were working for almost a year before we were able to actually hire someone. We had a, we had a great partner early on that was working with us part-time. Mm -hmm. Then we were able to pay her actual money instead of just favors. Then we uh, we won a couple of these competitions. We got some government grants to do some development work. We sold some product, which was which was a fun boost early on in our lives. We sold product. That must have been exciting. It was exciting. It was when the contract came in. We realized, okay, now we actually have to make all of this stuff. Yeah. So it was like weeks of hand making product and like late wow. into the night figuring out how to put stuff in boxes so we could ship it to make it look like a like a real product not yeah. just some r d project that two kids were doing crazy and like we, what a difference in like skill set because now you got to make something look pretty and it's like oh totally today. and we we were like engineers which is yeah. you hear about engineers like doing start, silicon valley startups and like making a ton of money but it's not always the best skill set to have when you want to try and run a business mm. so it was two engineers with at the time, low people skills. Okay. Trying to make nice products that people would buy mm. and like show them the benefits of buying the product, not just telling them this is what this mouse trap would do. Mm -hmm. That was that was core to why we failed, was we were focused too much on making cool mouse traps. 
mm. that did things mm -hmm. and not delivering value to a person that may want to give us their money. Wow. So yeah. what did, what was that like after um, pitching for a bunch of money? And like you, you, you had some people that were on board. I remember mm -hmm. this one time um, I, I got, I think three grand from a pitch competition and then ended up changing the business idea a month in mm -hmm. the investors were pissed. And then I changed it again a month in. the investors were pissed. I changed it again a month in after that. And after four months, it was like a four month program. I was one of the only people in the program that, that made money. And the thing is the idea that I had pitched originally and the money that I got didn't even go into making the money. And it was a tough conversation for me. I could only imagine what that conversation was like with some team members, some investors, some people that ended up funding you guys, mm -hmm. you know, like what, what was that experience like? Uh, for you. I'm, I feel for you. Yeah. I feel for you. Because I think what you had was somewhat the wrong, wrong expectations. Mm -hmm. First of all, they gave you 3000 bucks. That's, not, that's nothing. It, Dude, goes, you can't it even goes wipe, in a week. You can't even wipe your ass with $3,000. <laughs> Let's be real. You could, but <laughs> like for a short amount of time. Yeah. So like that, that maybe some mismanaged expectations to get upset with you. But yeah. when you start a business, mm. when you like say to yourself, okay, I am in a business, it doesn't really become a business for for a very long time. At the beginning, you're a scientist experimenting. Mm -hmm. So what you were doing is what you should have been doing is like, mm -hmm. go test the hypothesis, mm -hmm. get some feedback. Mm -hmm. And if the hypothesis isn't validated, then change it. Mm -hmm. Like you can either change the hypothesis or change how you test it. But in, in both ways, you're still experimenting. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not logical that you're just going to like come up with an idea and then run it to the end and you make a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that has happened. I, I, I would wager it doesn't happen because you would have to know enough people's pain so well that it never needs to change, mm. which is which is an incredibly low probability. Mm -hmm. More likely what happens, when, what you see happens, what's happening with us right now, what we didn't really do that well in the last business is that you come up with an idea, you make your minimum viable product, like the cheapest way you can do this, PowerPoint crayons, pa paper, yeah, and then you go and find enough people to say, would you pay for this? Mm -hmm. Do you like this? Is this the pain that you have? Mm -hmm. And if so, would you exchange money for me to solve it? Mm -hmm. And they say no to you, which is, which is great. And then you say, okay, why not? You know, yeah. what, what, what don't you like about this? Yeah. What's the pain that you have? Tell it to me again. And why doesn't this solve this? Why wouldn't you pay the money I'm asking to solve this? Mm -hmm. And when they say no, when they tell you, that's that's the most valuable thing you can have. So did you not ask that with the hypersensitive thermodynamic you know, fiber optic thermo thermometer? That's a good. That's a new headline <laughs> for it. You nailed it. Uh, honestly, we we were not um, courageous enough to ask those hard questions. I mean, it's tough, right? Especially like this is your baby, and you poured so much into this, like it's it's scary asking for that feedback, yeah. especially with the fear that someone's going to reject it. And, and tell you, tell you that your baby's ugly, right? You know what? That, that's a great way to say it because that mindset is the, is the wrong mindset to have. Mm -hmm. Like you want to start a business, you're starting the business to make a ton of money or like achieve some long-term mission. You want to yeah. like, like your previous guest, you want to feed the hungry. Great. Mm -hmm. How you do that, like what that baby is mm -hmm. shouldn't matter. That's not your sticking point. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get to the end goal. Mm -hmm. However you get there is up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Like with, within the rules, within the laws, there are tons of ways to find your way to the end. Yeah. So for us, our goal was to make money. We wanted to be a profitable business. My goal right now is to make money. I want to be a profitable business yeah. so I can deliver value to my clients because if I'm not profitable, I can't do that. I can deliver value to my employees because if I'm not making money, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. Mm -hmm. How our software looks or how my previous products looks, that's up for grabs. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, your baby's ugly... I would say, yeah, yeah. Okay, what don't you like about this? Yeah, because I don't care about this baby. Mm -hmm. Maybe we shouldn't use the baby as you know. I don't I know. care about this. <laughs> like this, this product is ugly. Yeah. Okay, I don't care about this product. I just yeah. care about making you happy. Mm -hmm. So how can I make you happy? Tell yeah. me honestly. Yeah. And those hard questions we avoided. You know, in the moment, like, this is it's easy to be retrospective and be more mm -hmm. critical now in hindsight. Mm -hmm. In the moment, we were probably thinking we were asking the right questions. Yeah. But I'm going through that same cycle now, mm. and fortunately, I have coaches that remind me when I'm not asking the right questions. Hmm. You gotta be you gotta be really blunt. If someone's willing to give you their time to give you feedback, you gotta like appreciate that and be blunt and say, okay, Definitely. I expect you to be giving me more money. Yeah. Okay. Like let's be transparent. I'm running a business. You're a you're a prospect. Mm -hmm. I expect you to give me money. There's no trick here. And I don't want to trick you into giving me money. So mm -hmm. I expect you to pay for this. Would you pay for it? No. 
why not? Tell me mm -hmm. honestly, mm -hmm. because if I can change that, I'll change it and then I'll deliver the value and that is, you're looking for. Is that the script right there? Like, bring, bring, hey, Mike, this is Javon. What's up? You're like, why aren't you paying me enough? Like, how's this conversation? Is this exactly? I, I actually just went through this for yeah. the last six hours. Okay. Okay. Today was one of the, the last few days I've been this sort of like interview period because okay. we're at the point with Iceberg where we got a bunch of clients. Mm -hmm. They're happy. Mm -hmm. But we have been expecting them to be happier, you okay. know, like in, in, in full honesty, I've been expecting them to pay me more money. I've been expecting them to use the product mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're at the point where I got to ask them, why aren't you using the product more? Like yeah. there's no hidden strings here. Tell me, mm -hmm. I thought you'd be using the product more. Mm -hmm. So why, why aren't you doing it? What am I missing? Mm -hmm. What would it take to get you to use the product more? Because you like the concept. I like the concept. We're missing something in the execution. So tell me. Mm -hmm. Some people don't feel comfortable telling you because they're like avoid confrontation, which is fine. Yeah, yeah. But if you get lucky and someone says, Mike, here's why I don't like this. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful because that's, that's worth more than money right now. Yeah. Because I need that feedback to make it better. 100%. And, and you got to pursue that relentlessly mm -hmm. because that's, that's the only way that you're going to get better is if you, if you have a prospect that you're trying to make happy and you're not making happy. And they can give you that feedback. Yeah, that's worth way more so than money. What does what does Iceberg do at this current moment? You know, because a, as you take feedback, it might change. Mm -hmm. You know, but there's there's a mission that you guys are trying to solve. There's something that you guys are after. I know you, profitability is definitely one of them. Um, but what types of what 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 vehicle does that take shape in currently? How did you guys come up with that? Where are you guys at along this journey? Our main mission is to try and protect small business owners from cybercrime. Mm -hmm. That's like our overarching vision. Mm -hmm. we, that's, that's why we get up in the mornings to help people not get screwed by cybercrime. Mm -hmm. It happens far too often. Mm -hmm. One in five Canadian small businesses have some issue where they're a victim of cybercrime per year. One in five. Wow. So that's ev everyone you know. 20%. Yeah, 20%. Yeah. Someone you know is a victim of some faceless, random cybercrime. So, so is this like you know, the people texting my mom on Instagram and saying, Hey, give me your password exactly. and her falling for it. Or is this the CRA calling me? CRA calls, yeah. uh, scamming people for credit card information, scamming people okay. for gift cards okay. in the small business world. It manifests as like breaking into someone's email and sending spam, sending them fake invoices so that they pay locking you out oh, of your shit. files. Okay. R ransomware is like the, the theme of the last couple of years. Ransomware is just software that, breaks into your computer, password protects all your files, mm. and then tries to charge you money to get your files back. Oh, That's wow. what ransomware this is, is. This is like real stuff. So this this <laughs> happens this happens at incredible rates right now. Huh. It's it's a it's a travesty that it happens so much. Yeah. But this is a reality that all small business owners have to worry about now mm. because it's easy. Like uh, AI and software automation have made it very profitable to be a criminal mm. for a short period of time until the law enforcement catches up with you. Yeah. But even when the, when the cops get the uh, criminals, the small business owner still has lost like 50 grand and has to live through that. Yeah. And then at that point, like 50 grand with 70 employees or sorry, seven employees. 50 or grand will sink a small business. 50 100%. grand in one day will sink a small business. 100%. Yeah. So how did you go from thermo, mm -hmm. super semiconductor thermometers, fiber? <laughs> right. Fiber to cyber. Like, how did you? That's a good way to put it. Fiber to cyber. Yeah. Well, you can take that one, okay? Okay, I'm going to yeah, put that on my charge. The first one's free, okay? The next one, I'll have to charge <laughs> you. <laughs> I like computers. Okay. I like to think that I know a decent amount about computers. Okay. I probably do. Yeah. I like computers as a kid. There's more than 100 computers in this room with us right now, so I like computers. <laughs> I, I know a lot about how computers work, mm -hmm. and I know that I can help someone learn about computers. Okay. And that was, that was like what was pulling on my mind. I, the last startup didn't work out. I don't know what it is about my personality, but I did not want to go get a job. Mm. So I knew that I wanted to go through the breach again. And I love computers. Cybersecurity is a fun puzzle. Mm -hmm. This has got a lot of moving pieces. Okay. It's, it's the game of chess where it's happening in 4D. Not everyone knows where the pieces are. I like that. Mm. And that was, that was what I was talking with my friends uh, summer last year. 
what are we going to do with ourselves now? We don't want to go get real jobs. Yeah. We still want to put all, all of the stuff that we had learned over the last six years. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to just give up on yeah. that. 100%. I wanted to, I wanted to make money off of the stuff that I learned. Mm-hmm. I did the learning. Mm-hmm. I want to do the earning now because yeah, yeah. I did, I did a ton of learning. I'm still learning. That's not going to stop, mm-hmm. but I'm doing a little bit more earning than I was before. So that, that was the choice was, uh, COVID was a big hit for small businesses with cybercrime. It was all in the news. I knew I could do something about it. I wanted to do something about it. And we came up with a decent idea. Mm-hmm. It has a lot to do with communication. Uh, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the pitch on what iceberg is. So yeah, please small business, cybersecurity. That, that's our thing. Okay. Our main product is the cyber score, the okay. cyber version of a credit score. Mm. And really what that is, is a communication tool. Because okay. cybersecurity to most regular people mm-hmm. is super complicated yeah. and they don't understand it. There's a lot of tech jargon. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That is that is like one of the main issues that we're working against. Too much tech jargon. Mm-hmm. We got all these cool hacker screens behind us because it's it feels cool yeah, yeah. and it looks cool. But to the regular person, they, they don't know what that means. So clue. we're just trying to make it simple enough that they can appreciate it. Okay. Just like a credit score simplifies like all the complicated actuarial stuff behind your personal finances, your business finances, mm-hmm. we're trying to boil down all the compl- complicated fog and mumbo jumbo behind cybersecurity mm-hmm. into a little score with a with a ladder that small business owners can use Should to make themselves it. better. Man, that, it's, it's cool because it's almost like this gamification of like your security, right? I know with me for my credit score, I'm always like, oh, how do I get my points up, you know? Just cause like, and I know so many people, especially being in like a finance world and a personal finance world and a real estate type of world, so many people stress over this credit score. So I think by having this, um, as a, almost like a tool Mm -hmm. that businesses can use is going to really help, you know, people improve their security in a place where they didn't even know that they needed it. Totally. That is exactly it. Like to use it as a ladder Mm -hmm. so that someone can say, uh, my score is 35%. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. We, we have a ton of educational information on the, on the website, mm-hmm. tutorials. We, we sell products, but this is sort of like the freemium part. Okay. The education is free. How we get you the information, we got different tools to do that. But cool. you can get your score. We give you free tutorials so you can get, get some low-hanging fruit improvements mm-hmm. and try and raise the, the tide so that more small business owners feel comfortable. And we, we knock down this 20% number, the one in five, to mm. something lower. <laughs> I mean, practically speaking, I don't know how, how yeah. much we can push it, how low we can push it, but yeah. you know, that's the mission. Push it lower. Yeah. Cause this is just like, this is, this is criminals breaking into a business and stealing money. Yeah. If they, this was happening physically, people running around Toronto, breaking into the be, buildings, yeah. the cops would be on the street, mm. but so, so on, like a superhero, th- you know, this is a harder, this is a harder dynamic because you can break into a business and steal $50,000 from them. Mm. No one would know who you are, where you are, mm. when it happened. You can be on the opposite side of the world because the internet connects us all. Your front door is the same front door as someone that lives in Thailand. Hmm. And so the, 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 the battlefield is now everywhere. Yeah. Wow. So there's, and there's tons, there's tons, like we're security professionals. There's tons of security professionals, Mm -hmm. whether they work for law enforcement or the private sector for the Mm -hmm. government, everyone's trying to help make a difference. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're part of the crew trying to help. Man, this is really cool. So what types of things, so you, you got like a science background. I am an engineer. I got the iron ring. Let me see The, the University of Toronto Ooh. graduated 2012 mechanical Ooh. engineering. That means more than diamonds to some people. <laughs> this, this rust line on my pinky finger you says pay, that I'm an engineer. You paid the iron price for that one. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so like you've got this new kind of baby that you're playing with, this new environment that you're in where you've got your product in the hands of the people um, that you wanted to put it in the hands of. Now, how do you, I'm, n- I'm not from a science background, but I'm really curious to how you're going about uh, this experiment right now mm-hmm. and testing, measuring the test, what types of things you're paying attention to um, in terms of like you just went on six hours of feedback calls, mm-hmm. right? Now you're trying to take this and implement changes into the product um, to make it better and improve it. How are you approaching the measurement of this Mm -hmm. new product changes these new features this rollout what's that look like you know for you excel spreadsheets if if it's not too personal oh not at all like excel spreadsheets notes 
like you would imagine watching MythBusters mm-hmm. or you know Bill Nye the Science Guy from when we were kids. Yeah. Write down some ideas, mm-hmm. put it in bullet points in Word or in your notepad, and then go and execute your test. Write down the results. Think of new tests mm-hmm. and keep doing that. It's mm-hmm. it's there's no complicated here. You don't have to be cute on how to like over engineer this. Mm-hmm. You don't need some fancy SaaS product to help you do it. Mm-hmm. Sure, there's tools that can make it easier, but really it boils down to writing down an idea. Hmm. Running some tests, which means like if you want to see if ads work for your business, okay, write down some headlines, pay 500 bucks for the ads, run it for four weeks, measure how it worked, mm-hmm. analyze whether that worked out for you, then do it again. And we're going through that process. We've gone through that process for 12 months now. Jeez. Writing down some ideas, testing it. We've had, we still change the, how the product is pitched. It's gone through like five different iterations. Wow. Whether it's an internal tool for IT people, selling direct to small business as a prospecting tool, as an upselling tool, mm-hmm. as the freemium cyber score thing, as a paid cyber score thing. It changes all the time mm-hmm. because I'll pitch it to someone and they'll say, oh yeah, I like it for that. Okay, it does that now. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, that's what it is. Yeah. I know I told you it was something else, but that's what it is now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you know anyone else that would pay for that? Mm. Oh, yeah, I got three friends. They would pay for that. Okay, that's what it is now. That's the product. Mm. And you do that. Like, is, It doesn't mean that you're just like chasing the wind all the time, but mm. if you find someone that says, yeah, I like that part of it. Okay, let's just say it does that. Yeah. You know, that's the smoke screen. Yeah. But what do you like about that? Mm-hmm. How, how, much, how much would you pay for that? You know anyone else that would pay for that? Mm-hmm. And you keep asking until they say no. Hmm. And then you say, okay, well, wh- why not? Why wouldn't you pay for that? And you, you keep asking mm-hmm. hard, genuine questions mm. to learn what people like, what people don't like, listen to their pain. A lot of the times I'll meet a prospect or we're, we're talking about cybersecurity. We don't talk about the product. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, there's tons of times I pitch, but sometimes I'll go into an environment. We don't talk about the product. Just ask them, what are they doing about cybersecurity? What's their experience? Mm-hmm. If they're a small business owner. You don't ask like, what's your cybersecurity experience? You say, yeah. how's the business going? Mm-hmm. Are you concerned about this? Who, who does your IT? What does that look like for mm-hmm. you? Oh yeah, my, my little cousin does our computers. Yeah. Okay, you're a law firm. <laughs> so that's not really that professional. What do you yeah. think about having some more professional aspects of your IT? And we mm-hmm. talk about that. Mm. So still now in the experiment phase, we're interviewing and collecting information. Mm-hmm. Sometimes will inject, like, okay, this is what our product does. Mm-hmm, what do you mm-hmm. think about that? Mm-hmm. And they'll tell us, no, uh, I'll never need that. Mm-hmm. Okay, why don't you think you need that? Because I, I perceive that you have a pain here. Mm-hmm. And then I tell them, we go back and forth. Mm. And then they say, no, I don't perceive that to be my pain. Why mm-hmm. not? Mm-hmm. What were you doing now instead? Mm-hmm. What if this type of thing happened? Oh, yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... If we can stop that from happening, is that worth X amount of money to you? No, mm-hmm. it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. Why not? Why isn't it worth that much money? Because that's mm-hmm. that's what everyone else is paying. So why don't you think, you know, it's, it's about perception. Why don't you think it's worth the money? Mm-hmm. Uh, that'll never happen to me. You do a little bit more education. Okay, yeah, okay. That'll happen to me. I would pay this amount of money to make that not happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we're talking. It's interesting because it's almost like selling insurance. You know, well, like you, you got to say the, the sales process is pretty much the same, no matter what business you're in. Yeah. The prospects got to have confidence in you, confidence in the company mm-hmm. and confidence that you can deliver what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. outcome, confidence, delay and effort. Yeah. We know yeah. the value equation. 100%. So every, every sales process is the same, whether you're selling insurance, whether you're selling security, yeah. whether you're trying to sell hyper dynamic thermal fiber optic sensors, you be, new tagline. Right. Dude, if you want to buy one? I got one for sale. I got a I know a guy, dude. Full. I, know, I know a guy. You get the brokerage deal yeah. on that. Sure. Good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That, that's the sales process. Yeah. Yeah. I I know I'm only on startup number two, so I'm not some like grizzled veteran. Mm-hmm. Startup mm-hmm. number two is still a little, seven years worth of life, but it's okay. I think too often when people are trying to run the business or mm-hmm. run a business or start a business, yeah. these are the conversations that they avoid because they're hard. Mm-hmm. I see it with my startup friends or and people in the startup circuit where Mm -hmm. like i was in my previous company Mm -hmm. you you come up with your idea you say this idea is my baby Mm -hmm. thinking that that idea is going to take you to the end Mm -hmm. which is which is just wrong expectations yeah you got to go into it knowing the first 12 ideas that you have are not taking to the end so Mm -hmm. be ready yeah to just spin and reject them for the next better idea until yeah. you find something that'll take you to the end. It's really cool, man. It's it's literally back to your Formula One days. It's like we're, we're building a vehicle that we're hoping will take us over this finish line. 
you know, or at least just keep running laps around the track as fast as we can and, and love every second of it. You know, like we really just are building a vehicle to get us to this destination. And if, if the wheels don't rotate, right, if the steering wheel doesn't feel right, we've got to go back and we've got to adjust it. Mm -hmm. And I, I really admire that. And I think it's really cool what you're doing. And I think it's a really cool approach. Now you learned a lot from the fiber world, you know, or that fiber experience, you know, I w I'm curious, what was your, which loss or which lesson or which experience led to the favorite lesson from fiber? Hmm. This I'm living right now hmm. because someone close to me reminded me of this lesson. And a lot, a lot of what we need as entrepreneurs is more reminding and less, you know, like learning and coaching, just like reminding you of things that you already know. Mm -hmm. And the, and the lesson was you, it's more important to learn why you fail than to know why you win. Like when you win something, that's, that's good. That happens so, so, so rarely that it's not important for us right now, mm -hmm. but knowing why you fail is really important. Hmm. My, the interviews that I have been doing, like mm -hmm. I'm failing because my clients aren't paying me enough money. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. I need to know why. Mm -hmm. Cause if I don't know why, and I just like say, okay, they don't like it, whatever. I'll go find someone else. Mm. I don't know why they don't like it. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know why I fail. So I'm just like rolling the dice that someone else will like it. But then, then you're just trying to get lucky instead of trying to get better. Mm -hmm. And we got to learn how to get better. So knowing why you fail was something we, we didn't embrace enough at mm -hmm. the last company retrospect, you know, like revisionist history. I may be changing in my mind, yeah, but whatever yeah. it's, it's to make <laughs> me feel better now yeah. and motivate me more. Yeah. So like we would lose deals or we would go bid on a contract, we wouldn't get it. And we would we would just discount and say, okay, they don't know what they want. The client didn't know what they, or the client was just whatever, whatever. You're, you're playing the blame game. Mm -hmm. But really what you should be doing is saying, okay, why didn't you want to pay for this? For, we're not bitter about losing the contract. Just mm -hmm. tell us why we didn't win it. Mm -hmm. If we were too expensive, why do you think we were too expensive? Mm -hmm. It's not about money. It's about value. Were we not delivering enough value? Mm -hmm. What, what did we not communicate enough value? Did you not really want this? We should have pre-qualified you earlier and rejected you. Yeah. What, 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 why did we fail? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to live that now is there's way more reminding than learning happening. Yeah. And, and I'm going through my client list and if, if someone's not meeting the usage ta uh, metrics that I expect, mm -hmm. I ask them, okay, no hard feelings. I thought you'd be using this more because mm -hmm. you like the concept. I like the concept. It helps you, but I thought you'd be using it more. So why are you using it more? What am yeah. I missing? Yeah. And then sometimes you get lucky and they're a great partner and they'll tell you, I wish this green button was red. Then I would use it twice as much. Oh shoot. Okay, good. Why, why didn't I ask you earlier? Yeah. Cause yeah. I can, that's a really easy change. Yeah. And I'm going to make that change tomorrow. Would you use it twice as much tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. use it twice as much more. And were there any like obvious or not obvious, but like simple changes like that, that you've collected? It happens in? all the time. Yeah. What were some of the ones like the small tweaks that people suggested that you're like, fuck what, why didn't I just do that? With, with our like software user experience now, that happens yeah. all the time. Software, fortunately, is very easy to change, uh -huh. you know, in, in some, in relative respects. So that happens all the time. It mm -hmm. happened today. Someone's like, I need a button for this. Mm -hmm. And we thought, wow, we didn't know that you were using it to do that. Yeah. But yeah, if the button was there, that'd be way easier. Button goes in. Like buttons are easy to add. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. shipping product is hard, but yeah. putting a button on a web app, that's easy. Yeah. That happens all the time. The, the hard part is like, reducing your ego and this isn't some sort of like meta rant but when we make a product it's coming from us to someone else like mm -hmm. we make a product and give it to someone else and say pay us money for that mm -hmm. but really we got to get from them because they know the use case better they're going to be using it mm -hmm. i don't use my product the, the client uses the product yeah. right and i gotta hear from them how they're using it mm -hmm. and then change the product mm. Because how I think it should be used is not really that important. How yeah. they use it is really the important part. Yeah. There's, there's some back and forth with with education, but how they use it is important because that's how they're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And when they when they tell you, yeah, I, I need this button to be red. And then that would be exactly what I want. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's put it red. Because we thought it was green because we had the wrong assumption mm -hmm. our perception of how you would use it is wrong but that's it that's we needed you to tell us that now it's now it's right yeah i think i think right now like you got me reflecting like i'm like shit i could have there's customers that i could ask about their use of trades yeah, right now you like, got how to can we change you, yeah you got to it's yeah, it yeah. sucks and it's hard and you got to eat crow because yeah. a lot of people 
this is we lower the voice for the honest truth here. Yeah. A lot of people have opinions that aren't constructive. Mm. You got to work through that. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to, especially when you ask someone for their opinion, mm -hmm. a lot of people think, well, if I say, no, I don't have an opinion, they're going to think poorly of me. So they just like create an opinion. That's, you know, like that's focus group 101. Mm -hmm. You got to work through that because mm -hmm. you got to like sift through those people and say, okay, yeah, that opinion is, that's a, that's, year was just weird. So like, <laughs> thank you for that. That's not constructive. Mm -hmm. And then you got to find the person that says, yeah, I would really use this if you did these three things mm -hmm. and I would vote for my money. Like that's a, an important part of the feedback is to mm -hmm. say, not just what should I change, but what does it take to get you to give me more money? And then the person says, honestly, if you did these three things, mm -hmm. I would pay you more money. Mm. You say, hey, you want to put a deposit down on that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll put a deposit down. That's <laughs> voting with your money because that's yeah. the person you want. Yeah. You don't want just someone to give you feedback because you asked. Yeah. You want someone to say, if you were to do these things, I would give you my money. That's the pain I need solved. Yeah. Those are great. You do have to sift through. Mm -hmm. And that's why you, you know, like keep calling people. We call a ton of people every day. We call 50 people every day. That's mm -hmm. part of our cold calling strategy. Okay, okay. And a lot of that comes with rejection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes with like dealing with objections on the phone. Yeah. But that's how you learn and like sift Grow, through man. the information until you find that one perfect ideal customer profile. Yeah. And they say, yeah, yeah, I would exchange my money if you could give me that outcome Perfect. with that confidence that delay and effort yeah and i know two thousand people like me yeah yeah that's my business yeah if you if you like making websites that's great but making websites isn't a business mm -hmm. you can make money and run a business and make websites mm -hmm. totally like we're, we're making software we make software but making software isn't a business yeah solving someone's problem in exchange for money is a business. hundred percent. We weren't doing that back then. We're trying to stay on that road now. And it, yeah. and like you weave all the time because mm -hmm. it's really easy to work in your cool home office mm -hmm. and like make cool things. Mm -hmm. That's easy because you work alone. Like you're, you're, it's coming out of your mind and you don't have to ask someone to reject you. Mm -hmm. But running a business means going and, and getting rejected a hundred times Over. until you find someone to say, yeah, that's cool. I like that. I'd right. give you my money for that. Yeah. Okay, sweet. That's what we do. Done. That's a business. Out to the races. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot more now you're spending your energy towards customers and being customer totally. facing, being out in the field, a lot more than being investor facing and grant facing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what was it that you raised for five Like something ridiculous over the lifetime? We, we were lucky with the grants. Yeah. You know, we... On paper, a fiber photonic clean tech startup in Toronto, yeah. high tech jobs. We, mm -hmm. you know, we were we were smart. On paper, it's great, and we're yeah. charismatic, so we come across in in the pitch as well. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> and the and the government is the Canadian government is fantastic for supporting mm -hmm. high tech companies, entrepreneurs. There's tons of support programs, mm -hmm. so we made use of the support programs. Yeah, we were hounds. That was money we could get. Mm -hmm. So we hounded that and got as much as we can get our hands on yeah. to give us a great runway. And and now what's your relationship with that type of funding? Not necessarily grant versus like investment, but more so money before you have your customer. You know, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts on like how your relationship stands with that now. Like, why don't you just go out and raise M's again or raise well, the, whatever, the, you know? The, the downside with raising investor capital is that you got to give away a piece of your pie. Mm. So when you like whether you're running a business or you want to have a startup, mm -hmm. the more of the business that you own, the the more the reward is at the end. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a simple equation. 100%. There's no, there's no secret there. Yeah. So to raise now would mean giving up a big piece of the pie mm -hmm. because we're still in experiment phase mm -hmm. and experiment phase means there's going to be risk because there's no recipe to success yet. Mm -hmm. There's no recipe to success. Yet. We got, we got great attributes like mm -hmm. there's good ingredients in what we have yeah and i i know i'm totally biased talking to the microphone directly <laughs> there's great ingredients that we have but there's still tons of risk yeah, we because the like best pizza like come on <laughs> i got the best i got the best dough i got the best freshest sauce. dough tomatoes yeah. from the garden yeah. we have good ingredients yeah. but there's still a ton of risk so to raise now mm -hmm. would mean giving up a big piece of the pie in exchange for de-risking it for the investor mm -hmm. totally that's that's mm -hmm. how the game works mm -hmm. so we're trying to bootstrap as long as we can mm -hmm. until we have a good enough recipe that we feel confident about that we can go to an investor with a moderate amount of risk so we don't have to sell off too much of the pie that's awesome, man. So where is it that you're looking to go next? I guess now it's just customer feedback time. 
you know, more reps. That's our main sets. thing. Uh, more reps. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Like we got it. The more people we call mm-hmm. and genuinely ask, Hey, do you have a pain here? Mm-hmm. And I, I think I have a way to solve it. What do you think about the way I solve your pain? Would you pay for that? Mm-hmm. The more people we ask, the more feedback we get. And the feedback is way more valuable than cash. Yeah. Cause you can't buy that feedback. Mm-hmm. You spend it in time mm-hmm. and in sweat. Mm-hmm. And like we burn the money by paying for products, sending it to people, they pay us back. But you know, like you're, you're spending your life trying to get that feedback. It's way more valuable than cash. Mm-hmm. So that's the name of the game for us right now. That's crazy, man. What a, what a shift in perspective. So if you were in the stands, right. And this guy comes up on stage, this guy named Mike Bacage, right. And, uh, he's about to pitch his fiber optics, super thermodynamic thermometer. Okay. And you know, you were about to give him a pep talk right before he went up on stage, right? Or let's say right after he got the 30, 30K of investment, yeah. right? That first, I don't know if that was the first one, but mm-hmm. we'll, for the sake of this conversation, we'll call it that first 30K check. You know what I mean? What would, what advice would you have for him? I just went through this because last, last week I was in the Netherlands for some stuff for the government. And I also went to a pitch competition. I wasn't allowed to pitch because it was only for European startups, but I watched three European, four European startups pitch. Okay. I've pitched, I don't know. I pitched a hundred times probably. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm pitching every day because I go to network events. Yesterday I was a network event. I'm pitching all the time. Okay. This is totally biased and it's way easier to be critical than it is to be in the moment. So mm-hmm. appreciate that. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. That's why I have, I like, I got coaches and people that I keep close mm-hmm. to remind me when I'm being dumb. That's mm-hmm. the value of a coach. Mm-hmm. Stop smart people from doing dumb stuff. <laughs> When I see, when I'm, I watch these four startups pitch, I've seen it all the time. I used to do this myself. You mm. talk about your baby, mm. right? That's usually, if you go watch someone pitch, mm-hmm. they're going to say, this is my product. This is why my product's cool. But that's not a business. You're just describing a product. Okay. A business is, these are the people that have pain mm-hmm. and this is why they give me money. Mm -hmm. And it's not complicated. It's like, this is why they give me money. Mm -hmm. This is how I solve their problem, Mm -hmm. period. How I do that is part of my recipe. Mm -hmm. But this is why they feel the pain. This is why they pay me to solve it. Mm -hmm. When we were pitching with Fibos, we weren't talking like that. We were were talking about our mousetrap. Mm -hmm. And I changed the pitch right after that, watching that pitch presentation. Then I pitched in the evening. Yeah. And I, and I lived it. Cause like once you, once it clicks in your mind, like, oh my gosh, I'm talking about the wrong stuff. That's what I'm talking about. is not a business. What I'm talking about is just a cool product. Yeah. But when you pitch to an investor, you want to know, they want to know, is this a business that can make money? Which means, is there enough people with a pain that would exchange their money for you to solve it? Mm-hmm. That's what you got to tell someone about. Mm. And so if, if any, if any entrepreneur or startups listening and you're thinking about pitching, which is part of the game, remember, like you got to tell people who feels the pain and why they would pay you money, not what you do. Like you make this cool software that turns zeros into ones. Great. But no one pays to get zeros turned into ones. Mm -hmm. They pay to like move information from here to here because that makes them extra money or it prevents them Mm -hmm. from feeling pain or makes them feel beautiful or makes them feel cool. That's why people pay money. Mm -hmm. Like people work out in a gym, not to lift weights. They work out in a gym to look good, feel good, look better than their friends, look good in a bikini. That's why people work out. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying, come to my gym, I got the best weights. My weights are always clean Mm -hmm. and we got these cool bikes. You could sit on a bike and go nowhere. Best bikes. Right? We got really good bikes. They (laughs) go nowhere. You can sit on this bike. No one's going to come to your gym. But if you say, hey, you come to my gym, you're going to look great in a bikini and all your friends are going to be envious. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do I sign up for your gym? Mm -hmm. Like that, that you got to pitch like that Mm -hmm. when you're talking about your business, because if you pitch like that, Mm -hmm. then the investors are going to say, great. I know a ton of people that want to look good in a bikini. That's a business. Perfect. Dude, I appreciate you taking the time, man. I know you've got a million calls like with, you can see it's streaming these, in and all these cool screens. Those yeah. are uh, this business right here. Business. Yeah. You know, all those all zeros those. turning into ones. Green lights. Business. You know, that's how it's going, man. But we, we really appreciate you going a couple layers deeper than just the tip of the iceberg, man. Thank you mm-hmm. so much. Now, are there any final words? If you could ask the audience one thing, you know, uh, one favor, because you were so generous with your time today. If they could do you one solid, you know, what would you ask? Well, my mission is to help small business owners be safe on the internet, Mm. stop them from feeling the pain of cybercrime, 
So if if you know a small business owner, tell them to come check me out. TheCyberScore.com is a great resource. They get to their CyberScore for free. We got a lot of free education. They can find us, TheCyberScore.com. Come find me on LinkedIn. Any of the listeners, if you, if you got that entrepreneurial mind, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm doing the podcast because I want to share my experiences. I paid in blood and time to learn these. And I'm more than happy with sharing with anyone. So find me on LinkedIn. Ask me more questions. I'd love to spread the word and help other people start a business, grow a business, deliver value to their friends and family and, and people that have pain. Mike, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in to yet another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, the show where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand a month. Now, I'm your host, Javon.ca, and I can't wait to see you on the next episode. Peace.